name is Matt Gerton. I'm one of the pastors here at Local, and we believe that we exist as a church in this place at this time to know God, to know him together, and to make his glory known. And so as we come together in worship today, as we come around his word, uh, my heart and my prayer is that each of us would be changed a bit more into his image, that we would love him more as we see his great love for us. Amen? You in for that? All right, let's go. Um, I was wondering if you can help me complete the old adage that says, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Younger generation, if you haven't heard that yet, your parents need to get on it. If a deal sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, We can raise our hands because I'm not going to ask you to tell me. How many of you have ever fallen prey to or been a sucker for a deal that sounded too good to be true and you just jumped right in? Okay, the rest of you, you'll think of one tonight. You'll be like, oh yeah, that one time, yeah. (laughs) We all have, all right? Uh, Some of you, if you bought into some cryptocurrency about 12 months ago, you got suckered, okay? You were a little too late to the game and now is not a good time. Um, But we have all fallen prey to that. And so today, believe it or not, we're gonna see the Lord and the Israelites formalize his covenant or his deal or his contract with them. And the deal just absolutely sounds too good to be true. It seems so lopsided. And it's like, why would the Israelites agree to that? It just sounds like he's trying to pull one over on them. And so before we go there, if you haven't been with us, you might be wondering, like, where are we? Okay, so I get we're in Exodus right now. Okay, so the Lord has already delivered his people from slavery in Egypt after 400 years. We covered that. He delivers them through the Red Sea and swallows up Pharaoh and his armies and his chariots with the Red Sea, we've covered that. And where we are today is they have been wandering around in the wilderness for about three months so far, okay? They're at the base of Mount Sinai. Two weeks ago, God spoke to the entire Israelite assembly, not just to Moses on the mountain. God spoke the 10 commandments to all about 2 million people. They all heard the voice of God. After he gets down with the 10th commandment, the people are freaking out, terrified, and they said, God, no more. Don't tell us anything else. If you need to say anything else to us, please just say it to Moses. And that's what happens, remember? So last week we saw that Moses then goes up the mountain. He's like, all right. He goes up the mountain. The Lord continues to speak to him, and the Lord gives him 52 more regulations or rules for life of what it looks like in daily living, in their business affairs, and their interpersonal relationships, in their households, what it looks like to love the Lord with all their heart and to love one another, okay? That's where we're at, okay? And so the Lord gives them these examples, and it it made it so clear that God cares about the details of our lives. He cares about the ways we conduct our business, He cares about the ways we interact in our households. He cares about the way we interact with our neighbors. He gave them such specific, sometimes really awkward scenarios to illustrate what it looks like to honor him in all of these ways. So he cares about the details of our lives. It reminded us that he is holy. His standards for righteousness and justice and love haven't changed, but it also reminds us that we are sinful and we needed some instruction because otherwise our heart does go to those wicked things, amen? We need to be told what honors God and what doesn't. And as Karen just mentioned, we spent a lot of time looking at those 52 commands, seeing that over and over and over again, God's heart is for the vulnerable and the oppressed. The women, the children, the unborn children, the foreigner, the widow, the orphan, God says, you mess with them, I will kill you. He was not playing games, and that is still his heart for those that are often exploited. And so today, Moses has received those 52, command, those 52 additional rules or regulations. It's called the Book of the Covenant, coupled with the Ten Commandments. And so he's, he's got this in his head that he didn't receive the Ten Commandments yet. He didn't receive those big pieces of stone yet. That didn't happen yet. God has just spoken it. And so Moses is getting ready to come back down the mountain. But before he does, the Lord has some more instruction to give him. He has some more terms of the deal to communicate. So if you would, turn to Exodus chapter 23 with me. If you grab the Bible in the back, we are on page 67, okay? Again, I'm reading from the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. 
and we're going to jump in. Hear the word of the Lord. This is Exodus chapter 23. We're picking up where we left off last week. We're going to start at verse 20. So Moses is still on the mountain, still with God. God says this. He says, Moses, I am going to send an angel before you to protect you on the way and bring you to the place I have prepared. Time out. God just told Moses, I'm going to send an angel to protect you all and to lead you to the promised land. I'm like, this is awesome. I forgot that was in there. He's going to send an angel. I'm trying to rack my brain. Like, when does in the rest of the story, the story does this angel pop up? And the angel's there to protect and to lead them. This is like the best Sherpa ever. And who is he? Who is this angel? Verse 21, be attentive to him and listen to him. Do not defy him because he will not forgive your acts of rebellion for my name is in him. There are two really big clues right there for who this angel is. He says, don't defy him because he will not forgive your acts of rebellion. Who can forgive a sin against God? Not a trick question. Only God can forgive a sin against him. Only God can forgive sin or rebellion against him. And so a regular angel can't forgive your sin against defying God's order. And then the last thing he says in verse 21 is, for my name is in him. This is a really strong expression or a very strong statement. It means when he says my name is in him, it's, it's not just the he carries my authority, but he embodies the character of the one sending him. My name is in him. It's another big clue. Verse 22. But if you will carefully obey him, the angel, and do everything I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. And so it's, he just says there, like, obedience to the angel is obedience to me. It's like synonymous. What are you saying, Matt? I strongly believe that this angel here is what we see in Scripture several times, a theophany. It's, a, it's an appearance of God in a different form. More accurate, I believe this is a Christophany. It's an appearance of the pre-incarnate Son of God. We've already seen with the burning bush, the Lord was speaking to Moses through the burning bush. That's a theophany. God showed up in that manifest way, talks to Moses. Several weeks ago, we talked about how Moses struck the rock, and it was the Lord who went before him, allowed Moses to strike him. It was Jesus. Jesus was the rock and poured forth. We went through places in the New Testament that tell us the rock was Jesus. It was in a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God. And so here, very clearly, this angel is not just a regular angel. This, we believe, is the angel of the Lord. And so God is saying, I am going to send the angel of the Lord to protect you and to lead you, to go before you as you enter the land. Now, who initiated this? Did Moses say, hey, God, can you send down a couple angels? We could really use them. I can't remember my way around this place. Who initiated it? God. God's like, I'm giving you the Ten Commandments. I'm going to give you these regulations. This is what it looks like to love me and love others. And by the way, I'm going to send, <laughs> I'm going to send the angel of the Lord to be with you. God initiated. God's the one that got them out of Egypt. He's the one that's been sustaining them in the desert with food and their clothing's not wearing out and providing water. He's the one that's going to continue to protect and to lead and to guide them out. He's the one that took initiative. He's the one that always takes initiative. And he's the one that has always been faithful and always will be faithful. Amen? And we see it here again. And so look at what he promises to do for his people. Notice as we go through these next few verses, all of the I wills. Not you will. Listen to what God is going to do on behalf of his people. For my angel, verse 23 again. For my angel will go before you and bring you to the land of the Amorites, Hethites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. Do not bow and worship to their gods and do not serve them. 
Do not imitate their practices. Instead, demolish them and smash their sacred pillars to pieces. In other words, you are called to be different. Don't try to blend in with these other people groups that worship other fake gods. Don't do that. And we're going to revisit that in weeks to come. Verse 25. Serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. I will remove illnesses from you. No woman will miscarry or be childless in your land. I will give you the full number of your days. I will cause the people ahead of you to feel terror and will throw into confusion all the nations you come to. I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you and retreat. And so fast forward several years and you get to the book of Joshua. And as Joshua and the Israelites are in the promised land and they're approaching Jericho, this huge fortified city, it was very imposing. Uh, Joshua sends some spies to check out Jericho. Some of you know the story. The two spies go into Jericho. They meet this woman named Rahab, an amazing story. But for today, Rahab tells them this in Joshua chapter two. It'll be on the screen. As these Israelite spies come into Jericho, she says, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings who you completely destroyed across the Jordan. When we heard this, we lost heart, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above, and on earth below. So that's telling us God fulfilled the promise he just made to them right here. I just gave you a sneak peek of many years down the road. I will cause the people ahead of you to feel terror and will throw into confusion all the nations you come to. I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you and retreat. That's what Rahab said. We are terrified. Verse 28, God says, I will Send hornets in front of you, and they will drive the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hethites away from you. And you're like, say what? Remember last summer we were hearing about murder hornets? I never saw one, thank, God, thank the Lord. Um, these are murder hornets. And you're like, well, I don't know. We're not exactly sure if this is literal or figurative. And I read some different things, but I'll tell you this. I'm like, well, if there were murder hornets going around, like surely that's got to show up somewhere else. Deuteronomy 7 uh, recounts this, like the Lord saying this, but then Joshua 24, 12 says this, and it's on the screen. This sounds pretty literal to me. I sent hornets ahead of you, and they drove out the two Amorite kings before you. It was not by your sword or bow. And so these are the two Amorite kings that Rahab just mentioned. I don't know. Could be figurative, some, God used something else, but this is not far-fetched, people. Remember how God used all kinds of bugs in Egypt? Literal bugs to set his people free? Sure, he can send some murdering hornets. I will do this. I will drive out the pagan peoples of the land before you. It won't be by your sword. The Lord did it. I know there's all kinds of crazy reports and false pictures and stuff, but an update I saw today showed some Russian tanks stuck in the mud and abandoned. The Lord can use all creation to accomplish his purposes and to break the arm of the wicked. Even mud. Verse 29, epic moment. Right on cue. Verse 29, I will not drive them out ahead of you in a single year. Listen to this. I will not drive them out ahead of you in a single year. Otherwise, the land would become desolate and wild animals would multiply against you. I will drive them out little by little ahead of you until you have become numerous and take possession of the land. Do you understand what just happened? They're like, yeah, the angel of the Lord's gonna go and send hornets and just wipe everybody out and we're gonna come in and like, we got the keys and we're in the new house. And the Lord's like, no, no, I'm gonna manage your expectations a little bit here. I'm not gonna wipe them all out at once. You're not? He tells them why. Number one, if I wipe them all out, it's a big area. It's a big territory. If I wipe them all out now, by the time you get and settle to in these different parts of the land, the fields are gonna be a mess and you won't have any food because it won't have been cultivated. Let's continue to let your enemies cultivate the land so that you're gonna have some food to eat. That's what just happened. 
It's an act of his grace to do this progressively. He says, the other thing is, if I wipe all those people out, the land will be overcome by wild beasts. I mean, they have lions and all sorts of stuff. If I wipe everybody out, the beasts are going to multiply, and then you're going to have a whole other battle ahead of you. So an act of his grace isn't to do it all at once for them. And I got to think, I was looking at this this week, how many times in our lives do we feel like, okay, the Lord's got this new thing for me or this new season or he's doing something new and like you, you start running into all this stuff. It's like, Lord, I thought you were gonna take care of all of this. How often don't we understand why he does what he does? Here he tells us explicitly like, at first we'd be like, why didn't you just wipe them all out? Like, just hold on, I got my reasons. <laughs> it's gonna be better for you if I don't do it all at once. I think that's really cool. It's a cool explanation, all right? Verse 31. I will set your borders from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and from the wilderness to the Euphrates River. For I will place the inhabitants of the land under your control and you will drive them out ahead of you. You must not make a covenant with them or their gods. They must not remain in your land or else they will make you sin against me. If you serve their gods, it will be a snare for you. And so the Lord is setting their borders. He's like, very clearly, this is the promised land. They knew what that looked like. They didn't have maps like we do or GPS, but he's like, this is it. This is your territory that I'm gonna give you. Your only responsibility is to remain faithful to me. Don't worship their gods once I get you there. Your responsibility is to worship me alone. Now, all metaphors and analogies break down, right? We all know this. But can you hang with me for just a little bit? This is what came to me, like it or not. It's kind of like a car salesman, no offense to car salesman, calling you up one day. The first miracle is you don't hang up on him. The second miracle is he's not trying to sell you an extended warranty for your car. But the car salesman calls you up and he says, we have a new car for you. And you're like, what? You don't understand. We have a new free car for you. We're gonna give you a brand new car. And then he goes on to say, we're gonna deliver it to your house. You don't even have to come get it. You don't even have to sign anything for it. And not only that, it comes with the touring package with navigation. See what I did there? And not only that, it comes with the lifetime warranty. You don't have to pay for that. And not only that, it comes with the service package and service agreement that all your oil changes, your brakes, your tires, even car washes for the entire life of that car are all included. You don't have to pay a dime. Oh, and did I mention it comes with an unlimited gas card? Sir, you're not going to spend a dime on this vehicle. And you know what? We will even pay for your insurance. You don't have to worry about that. All we need you to do, and you're like, here it is. I have to listen to a presentation about the Bahamas or something. All we need you to do is bring it into the shop for its regular maintenance that you're not paying for. You just got to bring it in. And the other thing you need to do is leave our dealership nameplate on the back and don't add any other dealership nameplates on the back. You still with me? That's all you got to do. The rest of it is all included. It's all yours. And you're like, this just sounds too good to be true. There's no way. There's a, this is a gimmick. There's something here. They're going to get me in something. This seems severely lopsided. Chapter 24. Then God said to Moses, go up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of Israel's elders, and bow in worship at a distance. Moses alone is to approach the Lord, but the others are not to approach, and the people are not to go up with him. Moses came and told the people all the commands of the Lord and all the ordinances. Then all the people responded with a single voice, we will do everything that the Lord has commanded. And so Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early the next morning and set up an altar and 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel at the base of the mountain. Then he sent out young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrifice bowls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. 
Moses took half the blood and set it in basins. The other half of the blood he splattered on the altar. He then took the covenant scroll and read it aloud to the people. And they responded, we will do and obey all that the Lord has commanded. Moses took the blood, splattered it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. And so if you're wondering, like, what's happening here? There's some odd stuff in those eight verses. What, what's going on? Um, it's time to sign the deal. It's time to agree to the terms. It's time to formalize this agreement, this covenant that God is making with his people, that he's inviting them into. And so it just told us that Moses had been up on the mountain. God says, go back down. You're going to come back up with some other people. But I need you to go back down first. Moses comes down. He tells them those 52 regulations because the people haven't heard them yet. People, these are the, the terms of the deal. The people say, we're in. Sounds great. All that you have said, we will do. So then the next thing it says is that Moses then writes it down. The Ten Commandments and those 52 regulations. This is the first time it's written down. He hasn't gotten the tablets of stone yet. Moses takes time that evening to write it down. He's drawn up the contract. Then the next morning, he sets the stage for the covenant ceremony. He sets the stage for the formal process of Israel responding to God's invitation to this deal. And so he builds an altar. He sets up these pillars that represent the 12 tribes. Like all the people groups are represented in this deal. Sets the scene. Then they offer burnt offerings. A burnt offering is when you would kill the animal as an atonement for. When, where there's sin, there has to be the shedding of blood. And so God set up the sacrificial system as a temporary thing. And so Moses instructs the young men, sacrifice the bulls as a burnt offering to the Lord. They would slaughter them, capture the blood, and then they would completely burn up the carcass, completely burn up the meat to nothingness. And that was to atone for the sin of the people. They burned it up. It's all part of the process. And then it says they offered fellowship offerings, which are also called peace offerings. These were also bulls that were killed, but they wouldn't burn them to nothingness. They would kind of grill them tenderly till they could eat them. And we're going to come back to that in a second. The, the meat was grilled and then eaten. The blood splattered on the altar was to show that payment had been made for sin. And then Moses reads the scroll. He reads the Ten Commandments and the 52. It's the official document. So he's telling the people again. He's reading it. This is what you're agreeing to. And the people again said, we will obey all that the Lord has commanded. It's this public, formal ceremony before the Lord. Then, after they've done that, Moses takes the rest of the blood and he splatters it on the people. And you're like, that's disgusting. It is kind of disgusting. And it was meant to be. Scholars say it's twofold. Number one, it's to purify God's people. Their sin has been temporarily atoned for with the burnt offerings and that blood shed on the altar. And now he's sprinkling the people as an act of ceremonially purifying the people But number two, the other reason is to remind them that if you break this covenant, your blood will be shed. To enter into a covenant like this, a blood covenant meant if either party breaks it, blood has to be shed. And so the tangible thing of blood being sprinkled on you, it's really gross. It's meant to gross you out and to freak you out. So that you understand the severity of the penalty if you break this deal. Still with me? Verse 9, and we're almost done. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of Israel's elders. And they saw the God of Israel. Beneath his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli, as clear as the sky itself. God did not harm the Israelite nobles. They saw him, and they ate and drank. This is crazy. And a lot of things I read about this, that scholars are like, we're not sure. <laughs> we're not sure. We do, know the, we do know what is said in black and white here. They all saw God. We aren't exactly what of God that they saw, but they saw a manifestation of God, and it was powerful. And what makes this complicated is in Exodus thirty-three twenty, God says to Moses, you cannot see my face, for humans cannot see me and live. So clearly they didn't see God's face. 
but they saw God. And it's a very dangerous thing, and that is why it says God did not harm the Israelite nobles. Like, it, he had to make it clear, like, this is a very touchy situation, and it is only the mercy of God that they were not harmed. But look at the next thing that it says. It says they ate and drank. Again, that is part of the process of formalizing a covenant. Historians tell us it was often the thing, after the two parties did the whole blood thing and the nastiness, they would often then sit down and share a meal together to show the unity and the peace and the communion that has been established. And so God invites these leaders, representative of the people of Israel, and says, come, and they eat together. Come on. Verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay there so that I may give you, he's speaking to Moses, so that I may give you the stone tablets. This is the first time the stone tablets come into play. With the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua and went up the mountain of God. He told the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. Aaron and Hur are here with you. Whoever has a dispute should go to them. So Moses knows it's going to be a little while. Okay, these two guys are in charge. When Moses went up the mountain, verse 15, the cloud covered it. The glory of the Lord settled on, the Mount, on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, God called to Moses from the cloud. The appearance of the Lord's glory to the Israelites was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. It's terrifying. Moses entered the cloud as he went up the mountain, and he remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So Moses waits up there about a week before the Lord brings him up closer, and then he's there another 40 days. How many of you know that the Lord is not in a hurry? He has a plan, and it always goes according to his plan in his time frame. He's never behind, and he's never early. Forty days, Moses is up there. And so back to the Car scenario. The Israelites are going to repeatedly blow their side of the deal. All that God asked of them was to obey me. (laughs) Obey me and don't worship other gods. Bring the car in for regular maintenance. You don't have to pay for it. And don't put any other dealer's nameplates on the back of your car. Simple. Simple. The Israelites blow their side of the deal over and over and over and over and over again. It's like the dude getting the car, never bringing the car in for maintenance. One day the engine blows and he's on the side of the road. I'm like, what am I going to do now? And he doesn't even call, but he notices a, a new car pulling up behind him and it's the sales guy from the dealership. He's like, I got your new car. He's like, what? He's like, yeah, this one's broken. Here, here's your new car. And the guy's like, how is this possible? I didn't keep up my end of the deal. This guy's like, well, here's the thing. The owner of the dealership knew you wouldn't be able to keep it up, and so he's already paid for it. It's already taken care of. And as we look at what we read today, And as we look at what we've already read in the story of Exodus, we're once again seeing that this is the story of Scripture. This is the story of humanity. This is our story over and over again. Remember when Moses splattered the blood on the altar, Moses said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you. That was the blood of some animals. The Israelites knew it should be their own blood, to atone for their sins, and it would be their own if they broke the covenant, so they thought. But remember at the Last Supper, do those words sound familiar? This is the blood of the covenant. At the Last Supper, as Jesus is preparing to die in a few hours for his blood to be shed, it says at the end of the meal, he takes the cup and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. He's pointing back to this moment. 
This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you. You blew it. You did not keep up your end of the deal. And so your blood is supposed to be shed. But here's the thing. My blood's going to be shed for you. His blood was shed once and for all to pay our debt and to restore our peace with God so that we can sit at that covenant meal that's yet to come. At the end of Revelation, when we all sit down together. And not only that, just as he delivered the Israelites from bondage in Egypt, he has delivered us from our bondage to sin, just as he didn't leave them alone in the wilderness In that in-between time, as they're wandering, trying to get to the promised land, he sent them the angel of the Lord. And as we are in this in-between time of he's come and he's done amazing things and he's given us the hope of eternity with him. So we're in our in-between time and it feels so many days like we're just wandering around the wilderness, blowing it. What promise did he give to us? He didn't say, I'm sending you an angel. He said, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. And so now his spirit lives inside of us, and his spirit is the one who guides us and protects us and comforts us and gives us gifts and power to live and to follow him. You and I, friends, are never alone. Our brothers and sisters right now on the other side of the world, hiding in basements and ditches, are never alone. He is with them. Ukrainian and Russian, the Lord is with them. We are never alone. And you're like, man, it all sounds too good to be true. Just over and over again, the Lord's like, I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this. And we, I need you to do this. And we're like, we're blown. He's like, I got you. My blood paid for it. He has proven over and over again that it's true because he is true and he is faithful and forever will be. Would you bow with me? Lord, for those here today who are discouraged, who are feeling condemned, who feel like the enemy has just beaten them up this week, I pray, God, that your spirit that lives inside of them, the spirit that you sent just like you promised you would, that your spirit would rise up and encourage them. Lord, for those here today who feel like they are wandering aimlessly in this desert of life, God, I pray that today your spirit would give them clarity. That you would give them the fresh bread that they need for today. For those, Lord, who have been skeptical and maybe skeptical for a really long time and just think all of this has just been just a sales pitch, Lord, I pray today would be the day that you open their heart, that you open their ears, their mind, and their emotions to receive you and to believe that, no, I think this really is true. That, God, you love us that much that you have taken care of both sides of the deal, both sides of the contract, both sides of the blood covenant. So if that's you here today and you've never just surrendered to, Lord, forgive me of my sin, God, I want to be your child. I want to have that assurance that I have hope. I want to have that assurance that this is, all of this is just not for nothing, Lord. But there's, a, there's purpose. There's a reason why you created me, Lord. I want to live my life for you. I invite you just to turn to him now in your own heart, to turn from your sin and turn to him. And he promises to put his spirit within you and to never leave you, to never forsake you, to not condemn you, and to give you hope. Jesus, we thank you that each week we have seen your great love for us over and over and over again. We thank you, Lord, that we, you are faithful when we are not, and we worship you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's-